of uh, studies with you by proclaiming to you something that is fundamental to the the gospel, fundamental to this matter of lordship and and submission to lordship, and without without this this lordship of Jesus Christ, what else is there? A kingdom suggests a king. I mean, if you're going to have a kingdom, you've got a king. And uh, we should not focus so much on the kingdom that, to the extent that we lose sight of the king. If we're kingdom citizens, nothing is outside the sphere of the dominion of Jesus Christ. There is a passage of scripture in Romans chapter 14 verse 9 where Paul says to this end Christ died and lived again in order that he might be. Now leave off the last word there. If you didn't know this verse of scripture what would you say? To this end Christ died and lived again in order that he might be Savior? No, it says in order that he might be Lord. The idea still lingers in some circles that it's possible to accept Jesus as your Savior and postpone indefinitely the question of his Lordship. And there's an artificial distinction between trusting Christ as Savior and confessing Him as Lord. The idea is preposterous. The New Testament knows nothing of such bogus Christianity. Salvation is not a cafeteria line where we can take the Saviorhood of Christ and pass up His Lordship. That is... We take what we want and leave the rest. It's inconceivable that we should cut Christ up and respond to only part of him. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And I want to tell you, Jesus can only be Savior because he is Lord. So let's don't emphasize the benefits of the kingdom to the of, of kingdom citizenship to the neglect of kingdom responsibilities. Let's not give all of our attention to the goodies of kingdom living and fail to stress the godliness demanded of kingdom citizens. I don't know about here, but in my country, there's far too much of the gimme gospel that's concerned only with the question, what's in it for me? The result is that we have a host of people who have come to Christ to receive handouts and just to receive only what Christ can do for them and they don't seem to be at all concerned about submission to his lordship. There's no option, really. No option between Jesus as Savior and Jesus as Lord. There's only one option. We can receive the Lord or reject him. But once we receive him, our option ends. We're no longer our own. We belong to him. And he demands absolute loyalty beyond that of any earthly dictator. Let's don't weaken the gospel to a cheap, easy believism that does not believe and a receivism that does not receive without any real confession of Jesus Christ as Lord. It's significant that the word, this may surprise you, the word Savior is found only 24 times in the New Testament. 
The word Lord is found 433 times in the New Testament. So what does it mean for kingdom citizens to be under the authority of the king? I don't know of any passage of scripture that more vividly answers that question than 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14. I want us to go there and focus on that passage and there are several key words and key concepts in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14. But thanks be to God who always leads us in his triumphant procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. In this statement, Paul gives us the key to living the victorious life that God desires for kingdom citizens. I want you to look at this phrase, always leads us in his triumphant procession. That translates one Greek word. Now, this was a technical term or a custom that was common in the Roman army of that day. And when the Corinthians read this word, they knew immediately what the Apostle Paul was talking about. Now, here's the custom. As soon as a Roman general won a great victory, he sent a runner back to Rome to herald the news. The messenger would run through the streets of the city, shouting that the victory had been won. The word preach comes from that very word, herald, because that's what preaching is. It's going ahead of the conquering hero to announce that the victory has been won. So I want to just focus here at these special, special, uh, the special significance because today we're so far removed from the first century that we often miss what Paul is saying here. So if you had been a citizen of Rome back in those days, and you went out of your house one morning and you, you heard the news that the victory had been won and uh, you knew there would be a parade. A particular type of incense was burned in the temples and the people began to make preparation for what they called a triumphant procession. And that's why Paul is referring here to the perfume or the fragrance. You smelled that incense. You said, hey, there's going to be a parade today. We're going to have a celebration. So when a commanding general, the conquering hero, returned to Rome, the people would line the streets. They were waiting for the appearance of the hero. The procession was led by a priest. The priest would be swinging censers, burning that special incense. He would be followed by musicians and dancers. But the main figure in this whole procession was the commanding general, the military victorious leader. He would be riding in a gold chariot drawn by white horses. Now right behind that chariot, now here's the key, right behind that chariot were the officers of the defeated army. They were chained to the chariot. Now keep that in mind, this picture, that military victor and the defeated officers were chained to the chariot dragged along now when the people saw their hero in that chariot they would shout and 
cheer. They would throw flower petals and confetti into the air. But when they saw the officers of the defeated army chained to that chariot being dragged along behind, they would really go wild. This was a demonstration of the power of their hero. Now that's, this is what Paul is referring to when he says, Thanks be to God who always leads us in his triumphant procession. So Paul was actually taking a, the, the, the custom of a pagan nation and turning it into a Christian concept. He was saying, there was a time when we were at war with Jesus Christ. There were hostilities between us and God. But the Lord Jesus has conquered us. We yielded to him in unconditional surrender. And Jesus has put us in the chains of his lordship. We're chained to his chariot. And everywhere we go, Christ is leading us in his triumphant procession. Now I want to clear up something here. Usually when people read this, this passage of scripture, that he always leads us in his triumphant procession, they picture us. We are followers of Jesus, and they get the picture that we're marching in a victory parade. Christ is leading us, and we are triumphant soldiers in the army of Christ, marching in that victory parade. That's not what it says. Let, we're not the ones marching. We are the ones being dragged along. We are chained to the chariot. We are the conquered ones. Let me give you some other translations that will bring this out. The New Living says, But thanks be to God who made us his captives and leads us along in Christ's triumphal procession. Now, wherever we go, he uses us to tell others about the Lord and to spread the good news like a sweet perfume. Today's uh, New International, the New International Version says, Thanks be to God, who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession to spread the aroma of the knowledge of Him everywhere. So Paul wanted everybody to know, before he went into a detailed explanation of his apostleship because when, when you go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 Paul is going to talk about some bad things happening to him and he's saying in anticipation he said I'm going to tell you some things that some of you are, are going to think reveals failure and defeat but I want you to know at the very outset, thanks be to God, he always leads me in his triumph in Christ. And wherever I go, it might look like defeat to you. It might look like failure to you. But I'm chained to his chariot. And that means that everywhere I go, I am following in his own triumphant victory in Christ. Now just a minute, Paul. How can you say that everywhere you go, there's victory? I mean, with all the opposition you've got and people saying bad things about you and all the persecution that you undergo, Paul says, I've been conquered by Jesus Christ. I'm chained to his chariot. And I'm simply following in the wake of his victory. Now here is the principle. Here's the secret. And let's underscore this. And everything else I say will be an elaboration of this statement. If you want to be a conqueror, you must first be conquered. If you want to be an overcomer, you must first be overcome. If you want to be a master you must first be mastered. If you want to exercise authority, you must first submit to authority. 
Now, most of us don't like that kind of talk. I mean, here we are chained to the chariot of Jesus. Most of us don't want to be back there behind. We want to be up front with the Lord. I don't want to be chained back there. I want to ride up front, helping to drag others along. And sometimes we say, Lord, why are we going so slow? Or most more than that maybe we might say Lord why are we going so fast Lord can't you speed this thing up or can't you slow it down other times we say Lord why are you taking this this road it's so bumpy it's got potholes in it Lord look at that motorway over there just a super highway or sometimes we say Lord I'm tired of traveling let's pull over to this lay by let's have a picnic now, in other words we want to help the Lord drive don't we that's where I want to be up front but Paul says if you want to be a conqueror you must first be conquered and I say to you that you are experiencing you're only experiencing as much victory in Jesus as Jesus is experiencing in you. If there's any area of, of repeated failure in your life, <clears throat> that's a pretty good sign that there's some area in your life over which Jesus Christ is not yet Lord. If we want to be conquerors, we must first be conquered. Now I want to give you an illustration of this. In fact, this is the best illustration that I can think of. Uh, <clears throat> you remember when uh, a centurion came to Jesus and asked Jesus to come to his house. This is in Matthew chapter 8. And he, he, the um, centurion had a servant who was sick. So he came to Jesus and, um, and he, he said, my servant is sick. And Jesus said, oh, I'll go with you to your house and heal him. Centurion said, oh, no, no, Lord, don't do that. I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Just speak the word and my servant will live. Now listen to what he said. Listen carefully at these words. For I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I say to this one, go, and he goes. I say to this one, do this, and he does it. And we read when Jesus heard that statement by the centurion, he responded, I've never seen such great faith, not even in all of Israel. I have a great respect for the word of God but I have to confess to you for a long time I couldn't see what was so terrific about what that man said I didn't understand it now listen I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me I say to this one go and he goes I say to this one do this and he does it Jesus was amazed and he said I've never seen such great faith well, what does all that have to do with faith well, I want to tell you, if something amazed Jesus, it ought to amaze me. If somebody could say something that would astound Jesus, I ought to be impressed by that statement. Now let's look at this encounter again. Jesus told the centurion that he would come to his house and heal his servant. The centurion said, no, Lord. I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Just speak the word and my servant will live because I also am a man under authority. Now I would expect his next words to be, now listen, I also am a man under authority. Don't you expect that he would say, I do what I'm told. If I'm told to do something, I do it. 
If I'm told to go somewhere, I go. But that's not what he said. He said, I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And I say to this one, do it, and he does it. You know what the centurion was saying? He said, I live under authority. Therefore, I have authority. And he did. He was an officer over 100 soldiers. That's why they called him a centurion. Now, here's the principle. As long as that centurion was submitted to the authority of the emperor, he had the emperor's authority over those 100 soldiers. If he rebelled against that authority of the emperor, he lost his authority over those 100 soldiers. That was the principle by which he was living. But that's still not what amazed Jesus. What amazed Jesus was one little word that that man said. And some translations have, I also. Others say, I too. Unfortunately, some translators think that word is so insignificant they leave it out altogether. Now listen carefully as I quote it. Listen very carefully and you'll catch it, I think. He came to Jesus and said, Lord, my servant is sick. Jesus said, I'll come to your house and heal him. The centurion said, oh no, Lord, don't do that. I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Just speak the word and my servant will live for I also am a man under authority. In other words, I don't have to do my own errands. If I want something done, I tell others to do it, and it's done for me. And Lord, I understand that you live by the same principle that I live by. When this centurion said, I also, or I too am a man under authority, that's what amazed Jesus. That the centurion had such great insight into the truth that Jesus himself lived by that same principle. He said, I've never seen such great faith. But the point I want to get over to you is this. This was the principle by which Jesus himself lived. He lived under the authority of the Father. Therefore, he had the Father's authority. That's the principle by which Jesus lived. Read through especially the Gospel of John. All through the book of John, Jesus said, I don't do anything by my own authority. He said, I do it by the Father's authority. All these words you hear me teach, all the deeds you see me do, it's not I, it's the Father. It's the, it's the Father's authority. So this was the principle by which, by which the centurion lived. He was under the authority of the emperor, therefore he had the emperor's authority. That was the principle by which Paul lived. And, dear friends, that's the principle by which we should live if we want to experience victory in the Christian life. If you are submitted to the authority of Jesus, then you have the authority of Jesus. It's just that simple. I want to share with you uh, three things, three things about this, this victory. First of all, this victory is God's victory through His Son. Now, notice what Paul said. Thanks be to God who always leads us in his triumphant procession in Christ. We're not the ones who are triumphing. It's not we who are riding in that chariot. No, he doesn't cause us to triumph. He leads us in triumph. It is God's victory through his Son. I'm trying to tell you that the responsibility for victory in the Christian life is not mine. It's God's. 
Now, many times we use the expression, win the victory. I'm going to go out there and win the victory. I'm going to overcome the devil. I'm going to win over temptation. I got news for you. There are no victories to be won. Jesus Christ already won every victory 2,000 years ago. When he died for us on the cross. Listen, every temptation you'll ever face has already been overcome by Jesus. The responsibility for victory is not ours, but Christ. It's important for us to know to know what I just said because most Christians feel it's up to me. I didn't do so good yesterday, but I'm going to do better today. And so I climb out of bed, I grit my teeth, and I tense my muscles. I say, I'm going to go out there and win the victory today if it kills me. And it usually does. The responsibility for, Christian, for victory in the Christian life doesn't rest with us. It's not our victory. It's God's victory Amen. through Christ. And the life that I now live in the flesh, it falls not I. It's Christ in me. I, I like the simple little story of David and Goliath as recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 17 now you remember that story uh, the Israel was at war against the Philistines and and um, one day David's father handed him some provisions the sack lunch said your brothers are out there at war take them this lunch and so David walked out there and and told his brothers here's your lunch from home now he looked out there and he saw this huge giant mocking Israel and Israel's God and the soldiers of Israel were hiding behind the bushes scared to death David says why don't you do something about that guy <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about David just leave the lunch with us and go back home, play your harp, and write your poetry. David says, I don't think it's right for him to get by with that, mocking God. Why don't you do something about it? Look, you don't understand the situation. Let us take care of this. We'll handle it. Go home. David says, well, I don't think you're handling it very well, and um, I'd take care of it. You'd do what? I'd take care of it. Well, go ahead and have a try. And you know what happened. They tried to put Saul's armor on David. He said, I don't need that. He said, it will swallow me up. I don't need anything. I've got my slingshot, and I've got five smooth stones. Well, goodbye, brother. Been nice knowing you. Now, you remember what happened. Here's young David marching out to meet Goliath. He stopped. And he looked that giant straight in the kneecap. And he said to Goliath, he said, the battle is the Lord's. He has delivered you into my hands. The battle is the Lord's. He's the one who has delivered you. The battle was not David's. Of course it wasn't. He wouldn't have been there if it had been. The battle was not Israel's. That's why those soldiers were hiding behind the bushes. The battle was the Lord's. What I need to learn to do is stand in front of all the Goliaths in my life and say to them, the battle is the Lord's. He has delivered you into my hands. It is God's victory through his Son. We've got a bad habit, pastors do, and all of us really, of calling the church by the pastor's name. People say, oh, I, I, I'm at uh, Pastor J.D.'s church. I'm at Bishop so-and-so's church. Hmm. We know it's not the pastor's church, but we've looked at it that way so long that we begin to think that it is 
Now here's the pastor. He's got all these people out here. And he they are his responsibility. He's got to take care of them. When they hurt, he's got to heal them. When they're angry, he's got to soothe them. And he's got to make certain he's got more people in attendance this Sunday than he had the same date last year or it won't look too good in the statistics and if he's behind on the budget well it's his his fault I mean it's his church he's responsible for it he's got to build it he's got to take care of it it's just too much for him hmm I seem to remember in Matthew chapter 16 Jesus said upon this rock I will build my church. Now, you see that little word? Underscore that one. My church. Lord, you mean to tell me this is your church? Yes, sir. Welcome to it. You know, it frees the pastor. Frees him when he realizes. It lifts the weight from his shoulders when he realizes this is Christ's church and it's his responsibility upon this rock I will build my church Lord I thought I was supposed to build it you see that's one of our problems you mean to tell me you will build the church this is your church and you'll build it yes what a deal that is I don't know of anything that will liberate a pastor any more than that now you understand it's not your responsibility to get people to walk down the aisle and join the church it's God's responsibility now you have a responsibility and we're going to get that to that in just a little bit but building the church is not my responsibility it's the Lord's church and he does the building I do what God tells me to do as faithfully as I know how and the rest is up to him it is God's victory through his son now you may be thinking that I'm presenting to you a gospel of just passivity. All I got to do is sit around and say I'm submitted to the Lordship of Jesus. No, we have a responsibility. We have a great responsibility. And I think it's essential, though, that we remember it's God's responsibility to give the victory and to give the growth. Now, first thing is, this is God's victory through his son. Second thing, it is our victory. The victory is ours through submission. Now we come to our responsibility. It's God's victory through his son, but it becomes mine through submission. How do I enter this victory? By submission. By living chained to the chariot. There are a lot of people who try to get out of those chains. This matter of submission just offends them. I want to tell you, my number one responsibility is to make certain that moment by moment, day by day, I'm living under his lordship. I'm living chained to the chariot. Every other responsibility I have flows from that. Now, those of you who are pastors, I want to share something with you about your responsibility. And those of you who <coughs> are members of the churches, I want to tell you what the number one responsibility of the pastor is. What is the primary responsibility of the pastor to this church? The top priority. His priority is not to the community. His priority is not to the members of the church. His number one priority is he himself. That is to make certain that he is living filled with the spirit of God chained to the chariot of Jesus because when he's filled with the spirit 
when he is living under the lordship of Jesus then the members of the church and the people of the community will be ministered to by the overflow of his life his number one responsibility is himself that is his relationship to the Lord Jesus chained to the chariot focus on that Paul said I bear about in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ why he said so that the life of Jesus that dwells in me might manifest itself through my mortal flesh and I want to tell you that's the only thing that will bless anybody the life of Jesus when I stand up when the pastor stands up and preaches to the congregation he can't bless anyone and minister to anyone in his own strength or oh, he can tell a few jokes and he can get a few laughs he might come up with two or three clever little thoughts but nobody's going to break out of their chains like that no hearts are going to be healed no wounds are going to be ministered to no lives are going to be touched the only thing I have to offer anybody is the life of Jesus that dwells in me and the only way people are going to be ministered to is somehow the life of Jesus that's in me will manifest itself through my mortal flesh and touch your life that's what ministry is all about now, I want to make certain that you understand it's not it's not the preacher it's not me I don't bless anybody I don't minister to anybody it's the life of Jesus in me that's what people need people don't need to hear my opinions they don't need to hear my advice what people need is to be touched by the life of Jesus the life of Jesus that is in me and I must make certain that I live in such a way that his life can manifest itself through my human personality and touch others and then people will be blessed Jesus said if any man come to me and drink out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water John chapter 7 verses 37 and 38 listen you're the river bed he supplies the river nobody has ever been blessed by an old dried up crusty riverbed it's the river that runs along through it this is God's victory through his son and it becomes mine through submission now I come to a very wonderful encouraging glorious thing that Paul says in this passage there are two phrases in 2nd Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 that you need to notice underscore them first Paul says thanks be to God who always then at the end of the verse he says he manifests through us the sweet aroma of him everywhere in every place so we have always and everywhere always that's time every place that's space we are time space creatures everything we do is in time and space now here's what Paul is saying listen and let it break through and cause you to rejoice thanks be to God who always anytime every time all the time leads me in his triumph in Christ and every place all places any place you name the place what I'm saying is and I think what Paul is saying is that if we can learn to 
live chained to the chariot of Jesus Christ there is no conceivable situation in life in which God cannot give us the victory now maybe that requires us to define the word victory <clears throat> I wake up I find myself in some trial some difficulty some adversity the first thing I do is check to see if I'm chained to the chariot of Christ I check to see if as far as I can tell I'm still living under his lordship if I am then there are two things about that situation first you know if I'm chained to his chariot then he's leading me he's leading me I like what, what God said through Isaiah he said I'll make the mountains my way the mountains are not the obstacles we look at them as obstacles, barriers God said oh no that's the way that's the way that I'm leading you that's the road do you realize you, you, you're going to find this hard to believe you're, you're going to find it hard to believe that God has led you this way and also second thing Jesus has already overcome it already if I'm following in the wake of his triumph that means that's exactly what Paul said it's a triumphal procession the victory's already been won and yet you're going through this trial this difficulty this hardship when you live when you live chained to the chariot do you realize that you are walking on conquered territory you are walking on ground that's already been conquered every time you put your foot down you place it on territory that Jesus Christ has already conquered he's leading you along and you're simply following in his triumphant train you know what that means according to what Paul says here there is no conceivable situation in life in which God cannot give us victory you name it he says what always it seems to me that covers all all time every place that covers every situation victory is staying chained to the chariot of Jesus even if he you know Jesus didn't say he didn't say I'll part the waters for you he said what I'll lead you through and he didn't say when the fire is there I'll douse the flames he said I'll take you through you understand what I'm saying to you? You are chained to his chariot. And wherever you go, you know that the victory has already been won. You're walking on conquered territory. Sometimes when we say, oh, i got to get out of these chains. If I don't, I'm going to drown. I'm going through the waters. If I don't get all... Uh, get loose from this chariot I'm going to suffer from the fire no do you know what uh, you know victory is just staying chained to the chariot no matter how deep the water gets no matter where the chariot leads I like what John says he said first John 5 4 faith is the victory he did not say faith brings the victory he said faith, he didn't say faith gains the victory he said faith is the victory preacher I'm facing this terrible situation it doesn't look good 
Do you still believe? That's the victory. This is God's victory through His Son. It becomes ours through submission and it remains ours in any situation. And if we learn how to live chained to the chariot, there's no situation in life in which we cannot know the victory. You know, I'm going to share with you in another session about the authority that Jesus says that we have. And this is sort of an introduction that I too am under authority, therefore I have authority. This is what Jesus said. And when he addressed his disciples, taught them there in the upper room, he reminded them. He said, every time you saw me heal somebody, wasn't I really it was the father I never acted on my own authority I acted on his now I'm passing that on to you he said because I have authority I'm because I'm under authority I have authority it's the same way with you amen